Okay, welcome AP Bio. Um, we are going to cover chapter 46, which is reproduction in um, the animal kingdom. So, um, to get started, there we already know there are two types. There's sexual, and the definition of a sexual is the fusion of gametes uh, to form a zygote. And then the zygote will grow and give rise to gametes by meiosis. Um, in general, the egg is large and not modal, doesn't move in animals, and the sperm is much smaller and modal. Um, now, asexual in the animal kingdom is entirely, almost entirely mitotic cell division that you're going to get um, asexual reproduction. So looking at this, these are some sea anemones, uh, homes to uh, little Nemo. And um, you can see this one here grew to a large size and it's splitting in half, very similar to fission, but we're not gonna call it binary fission, but just fission, it just splits in half. There is the traditional asexual reproduction called budding. This is a hydra, um, freshwater. You're gonna find these in freshwater, little stinging cells. I believe you saw a movie of a hydra eating a water flea using the tentacles to grasp, and this is a gastrovascular cavity. Here, budding, notice you've got a much smaller than the parent, so a much smaller uh, organism. This will then just kind of break off, float away, and, and you'll have another hydra, all via mitosis. Now, this is uh, an example of asexual reproduction. This is parthenogenesis, and parthenogenesis is um, female based. Uh, basically the egg does not need to be fertilized for activation to occur and depending on uh, mitotic division or even meiotic division you can have either one set of chromosomes or two set of chromosomes. So um, if it's just mitosis the two sets of chromosomes stay. If meiotic event happens with the eggs they don't need to be fertilized but often the half number of chromosomes will um, indicate what sex it becomes. So a female could make males. Um, that's another asexual part. Now talking about sex, there is a enigma to it all. Um, if we look at this picture from your book, asexual reproduction shows you um, that you start with one organism and in very few generations you have a lot of more organisms and this is a good thing because you can populate the planet and take over. <laughs> and if you look at sexual reproduction and so you would need two sexes, males and females, only one of which is producing, at every generation time you lose half of your possible generation. So it's very costly. So the idea sex ever be selected for. Asexual, you're going to see very large numbers, which is good, and you don't need much parental care, which is also good because it takes a lot of energy. Um, if organisms undergo sexual reproduction, usually you're going to have much smaller numbers of offspring. You can see even down to four generations, and they cost greater parental care. So hopefully you all know the benefit to sex would be variation. Here is um, a picture of hermaphrodism or hermaphrodites. Here are our segmented worms and hermaphrodites contain both um, gamete producing organs and cells so um, both undergo meiosis and they can exchange. Um, here these two worms are exchanging sperm so you still get variation from this um, worm sex. Now, fertilization uh, uses pheromones. All animals use pheromones somewhere along the line because if you're going to do sex, uh, be sexually reproducing, even though it's costly, we're going to do it anyway because of variation. Variation is critical for evolution and survival. Um, somehow we have to get the egg and the sperm together. And to do that, there are complex behavior patterns that have to occur and pheromones are uh, a great way of synchronizing that. Now, if the egg and sperm 
meet each other externally. It's called external fertilization. If they are all released at the same time, that's called spawning. So if one organism, all the females of an organism release all their eggs at one time, and all the males release all their sperm at one time, it's called spawning. And you see this a lot in the ocean, lunar cycles, things like that. If it's non-synchronous external fertilization, we're gonna need these pheromones because there's gonna to need to be some sort of courtship ritual. Now, internal fertilization is more efficient. Basically, um, the, you're gonna help the sperm get to the egg. But again, just like the courtship, you're gonna need more complex behavior and pheromones help out with that. Here is uh, a picture, there had to be uh, some sort of behavior or courtship modification, even though it's external, somehow the female needs to signal the male, um, please put your sperm on my eggs. So they do this with chemical signals and different behaviors. Now, looking at sexual anatomy, your book talks about a cloaca. Um, this is going to be, many animals have cloacas, but not mammals. Um, so we're looking at non-mammalian vertebrates. Um, the big one is the shark. A lot of times we've seen sharks. Um, here is female, here is male. And the cloaca is a common opening. And upstream from the cloaca, um, here we have a snake cloaca. You can't tell if this is a male or a female. You can't see a, a penis. Um, in here, but it, if it is a male, you're going to have some sperm depositing structure further up in the cloaca. Here, these are graspers and further up in the cloaca, a common hole. Uh, there would be, this is a male and this is a female, there would be a sperm depositor. This is not a turtle, a turtle cloaca picture was a little uh, graphic, but um, it is, I um, uh, believe, an alligator, not a crocodile. And here we have another amphibian cloaca. So it's a single hole, and upstream from that hole, you're going to have the anus, um, the vagina, or the penis structure, and the um, exit to the urinary bladder. Now, in humans, uh, looking at female structure, we're splitting it in half, we're going to go through the female structure. The cervix is the opening to the uterus. This is where the sperm is deposited, deposit, deposited. and um, uh, different times during the month it is coated with a very thick mucus plug that is a physical barrier to not just bacteria, and fungus and other things that want to get inside, but also to sperm at different times. Um, and this is what dilates to that tremendous 12 centimeters, I'm pretty sure that's 12 centimeters, um, to uh, push a baby out. It's very small normally um, in life. Now, the vagina here, muscular, elastic, this is where the penis will be inserted. Ejaculation again occurs here. Um, at the base of the cervix, and the cervix is actually muscular, can actually, I guess in this picture, it bends like this and dips into, um, rhythmic contractions will cause it to dip into a puddle of sperm to help facilitate the sperm traveling up into the uterus. Um, and this is what's traditionally called the birth canal, but you'll see in future pictures, it's not a very long canal by any means once you get a baby in there. Um, your uh, vulva is not mentioned here. Vulva is just a term for all the external female genitals. So looking at the vulva would include the labia minor, the labia major, the clitoris. And what I want you to notice here is the structure of the clitoris. You have something called the shaft. This is erectile tissue. It will engorge with blood. Erect. It engorges with blood. There is a glands, uh, high sensitive nerves, and there's a little skin layer on top called the prepus. Now I'm pointing this out because you will notice when we look at the penal structure, it's identical. Here is our urethra, the urinary bladder, pelvic bone. As we come up here, uh, we have a uterus, an ovary. The ovary is in the abdominal cavity. It's packed with follicles, so it's in the abdominal cavity. It's actually not attached to here. If you look at this picture, it's right there. Um, it's not attached to um, the fallopian tube or the uterus. It's actually just 
um, held there by ligaments suspended in your abdominal cavity. In the oviduct, the tube uh, branching from the uterus is the site of fertilization. Looking straight on, again, cervix, uterus, um, oh, well, the uterine wall, you can see how thick it is. Uh, very, so this is the muscular organ and will stretch and hold the baby, it will grow. It is, these muscles are responsible for pushing out the baby. Um, monthly, your uh, uterus continues to work out monthly and those cramps are the muscle contracting and, um, and working out. Uh, the endometrium is the lining in here. Now this is showing you a very thin endometrium lining. It's highly vascular, meaning a lot of blood. And during the month, it gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And if you don't get pregnant, if an embryo doesn't implant in the uterus, then it's shed as a period administration. Looking at the male, we're looking straight on. Doesn't always come out all this neatly, straight on. Um, first, we'll start with the seminal vesicle. The, there's one behind the bladder here and there's one on the other side of the bladder. So there's two of them and they're going to add to the ejaculate. Um, and they add to the ejaculate mucose, fructose, um, coagulating enzymes. And those are enzymes to get it to stick together. So the ejaculate sticks together and it's neat because you also have anticoagulant enzymes coming up too to try to break apart the mucus plug on the cervix but keep the sperm uh, together prostaglandins, remember these are hormones that are going to cause the female cervix to dip into um, that puddle of uh, sperm. Uh, they're local regulators so they'll actually act on whatever's around, ascorbic acid otherwise known as vitamin C, alkaline compounds, alkaline different from your acid so to neutralize the pH of the acidic environment of the vagina. Um, when we look at the prostate gland, you probably all heard of uh, prostate cancer. Prostate gland will add to the ejaculate an anticoagulant and citrate. But notice its location, form fits function, right into before, uh, the, well, I guess the first one upstream is called the bulbourethral gland. This is going to neutralize urine, and there's, there is some sperm, some, some fast swimmers in this. This is why coitus interruptus is a horrible method of birth control. This bulbourethral gland will release um, or secrete um, uh, substances that's going to neutralize any urine that might be left in the urethra. The prostate gland adds the anticoagulant and citrate and that anticoagulant is going to um, break down the mucus plug of the cervix. Um, then we see the vas deferens here coming down. This is the muscular duct so this actually uh, uh, muscular duct and this is what's going to squeeze um, and propel the sperm during ejaculation. Your epididymis is um, these coiled tubes and the epididymis is where your sperm matures uh, while passing through. They start in coiled tubes, the seminiferous tubules in here. It's not labeled, but these guys are seminiferous tubules. And within the seminiferous tubules, uh, sperm production begins. Leydig cells that are in there produce all the androgens, testosterone for production. They mature during uh, ejaculation, the vas deferens will push the sperm out, around, uh, through the seminal vesicles, which is behind the bladder, and then out your uh, urethra. Here is uh, the side view. <laughs> now looking closer to a sperm head, which we will get into um, uh, just a little bit uh, uh, next chapter, you've got all of this mitochondria for energy the neck, the tail, this energy is for the whipping of the tail. You have the nucleus and you have something called an acrosome. And what this acrosome does is it causes a reaction with the egg cell um, to actually help bore in and eat away uh, and get into the egg through the zona pellucida.